that was a huge accomplishment and accomplished by decades of effort for women pushing in that same direction. So when that resolution, it put that into international law. And now it's a matter of implementation. And that's hard. <laughs> that's the hard part. But we're going to be talking about that resolution as it applies to Korea and I think to Japan, countries in the area. And we have another very interesting angle to explore, and that is feminist foreign policy. Is that a term that is new to some of you? Yes? Well, it's a pretty new uh, concept. Well, maybe not the concept, uh, but the... <laughs> But the, uh, the term and the development of that is rather new. And coming from Canada, we have a prime minister who declares himself a feminist very uh, loudly and proudly. And he also has said we uh, are going to be employing feminist foreign policy. So it, um, it's it's spreading around. I, I know that Sweden was a strong um, initiator. I, I may be wrong there with the initiator, but certainly a strong promoter. Um, and they have, uh, as a, at the government level, have really put some uh, teeth into that concept. So today, as we talk about um, Korea and the, the enormous crisis in Korea, we'll also be talking about it from that angle. So I'm going to uh, introduce the speakers by name, and I'm going to ask uh, each of the speakers, rather than me telling you about them, if they would in turn tell you in a sentence or two about their organization. So first we have, um, I'll just name them all, and then I'm going to pass the mic. We have Kozuway. Help me with your last name. I, I should know, Akubia Bayashi. And Kozuway uh, is the president, the international president of WILF. Now that's, that's a funny uh, acronym, and somebody this morning said, WILF? What's that? They, they hadn't heard of WILF. Well, Wilf has been around for a long time, and Kazue will tell you about it. And our second speaker is going to be uh, Yong Soon, and she is from South Korea. And I will um, ask Yong Soon to tell you more about her her root organization. That's the um, Korean Sharing <coughs> Movement. And our next speaker will be Liz Bernstein. She's from Canada, and she's the founding director of the Nobel Women's Initiative. Our next speaker is going to be Ya Yong, and I believe you are you work similarly with the Korean Sharing Movement. Am I right? Oh, well, you can straighten me out. <laughs> Thank you. And our next speaker will be Mary Lou McFedrin. And Mary Lou, I know because she's a Canadian. She was actually on our board, our Canadian Choice of Women for Peace board, until she keeps moving around. And, and now she's in our Canadian Senate, was appointed to the Senate as an independent senator recently. And our last speaker is going to be Christine Hahn. Christine, where are you? I'm right here. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Logistics. <laughs> Christine. And Christine is the founder <laughs> and the international coordinator of Women Cross the DMZ. And you're going to hear more about that wonderful work and that wonderful um, in organization 
So first, I'm going to hand the microphone back to Causeway so she can give you, in one or two sentences, a little more about her organization, Will. Thank you very much. Good morning. I think like one sentence or two sentences can be a paragraph. Uh, and then uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom has been around for uh, over a hundred years. We, uh, was, uh, we started our activism in 1915 to stop the war that had started a year earlier in 1914, the World War I. Uh, we're still around to stop another war <laughs> in wherever uh, it is. Um, my name is Kozue Akibayashi, it's Japanese, it's long. I'm based in Japan. I am the yes, international president of uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. I'm a member of the Japan section of WELL. I'm also a steering committee member of uh, Women Christianity. I was among the, uh, the group of women, 30 women, who crossed the DMZ from the north side to the south side in, that, uh, in 2015. Um, I'm also a professor at the uh, Doshiji University, based in the uh, Kyoto, uh, Japan. Yeah, just start talking. <laughs> I think we just don't have time, so we just just go. So I will yeah. <laughs> I got the permission yeah, <laughs> to go on. So, uh, so I would like to start my uh, uh, my remark, short remark, about 1325 and. Um, the meaning of women, peace, and security agenda in this uh, particular context of a Korean Peninsula, uh, and maybe uh, experience of Japan uh, National Action Plan development. Uh, many of you are aware of uh, 1325 now, but Will uh, is one of the, uh, the main organizers of the, uh, the civil society, and we didn't really even call it a civil society at the time, uh, NGO alliance that pushed the uh, the adoption of 1325 in 2000. Uh, of course, there are many works, much uh, work done by women before that, but very intense period of lobbying at the United Nations, very smart lobbying of uh, civil society, women coalition, uh, made it possible. And it was not, the 1325 is not only the, uh, the first gender, uh, the Security Council resolution, that includes gender as a concept, but I think it was in a very good model for a civil society to, to probably learn uh, how the other uh, NGO coalition could approach to Security Council. That is still the hardest part of the United Nations. Um, that's, an, that's a part of the other uh, problem, I think, faced by 1325 afterwards. Um, around the same time in 2000, not only 13, uh, realizing 1325, but also civil society was trying to democratize United Nations, which is very patriarchal still uh, organization. Um, the, the two movements uh, started, like, what were going on for some time, we have not been really able to democratize uh, or decaturize dismantling patriarchy of the United Nations. And that's, I think, 1325 and the following um, women, peace, and security agenda uh, are facing. Um, one example could be uh, the Japanese National Action Plan. And we, uh, Japan, Japanese National Action Plan was, uh, uh, was uh, presented by our Prime Minister in 2017 as a part of the, uh, the Japanese policy, Japanese government policy that, I'm a bit embarrassed to say this uh, term, women shine policy. Women uh, shine? Yes, women shine policy. And I'm whispering. <laughs> <laughs> because we're the, uh, uh, Japan is one of the, uh, the worst uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, women's participation, political partici participation particularly, we are one of the other bottom uh, countries. Not only de uh, among the devel uh, developed countries, but the entire world. So, and we have been that way ever since. So what is this for me, Chen, I would say. That has been my question. Also, this uh, um, 
the, the lack of political participation of women uh, in the, in, in <laughs> okay, I only have three more minutes, um, uh, is, a, is a very problematic, uh, symbolic issue in this Northeast Asia region, particularly around the, uh, uh, on this issue of Korean Peninsula crisis. Uh, we've been calling for, Women for DMZ and our, uh, our allies in this region have been calling for more attention to this Korean Peninsula issue for many, 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 many years. All of a sudden we get this attention, yes, and all of a sudden for the past, uh, after a, a matter of uh, an hour, we just learned this uh, news about Tillerson uh, being fired. And we're trying to adjust <laughs> our methods uh, to the, uh, how to deal with this uh, another quick development in this region. We were very happy, we were happy to hear about this inter-Korea, the re a resumption of inter-Korea talk and dialogue and the southern, uh, and both governments should be credited, credited for that. Um, and there is, a, there is this uh, US uh, DPRK talk um, announced, well, where would that be, where would that go is now a question. And uh, like every day we are facing this quick development but what we have not seen is the women's contribution to this entire situation. Although we are the one women's group uh, in South Korea and in, uh, in, in other parts of the world. Uh, in Japan, very unfortunately, are not very, um, the Japanese organization are not, have not been very active in this, uh, in this issue. And they have a uh, very long historic uh, problem that is to say that continuing colonialism, colonial sentiment uh, of the Japanese society uh, towards Korea, uh, the peninsula itself, but also Korean uh, population, Korean diaspora uh, uh, in Japan. And that has been, yes, one minute. <laughs> that, has been, uh, that has been a very problem in our society, uh, as well as uh, in our foreign policy. The, the National Action Plan, for example, of Japan could have addressed this issue of uh, long-standing conflict in this region, and Japan could uh, could announce its uh, clear role to contribute to end this solution with uh, the support of women internationally. Uh, instead, what the Japanese government did with regard to the National Action Plan was to introduce, which is which is may not be too bad. Um, reconstruction from disaster, because we just went through, the Japanese society just went through the, uh, the aftermath of the, uh, the major earthquake and, and other natural uh, disaster, which is, which is important, but my criticism, and in one minute I have to, I have to wrap up, my criticism uh, of that is that the war and natural disasters are different by nature. And the war we could prevent by policies. Natural disasters, we can't. But we can't devise better policy to address what happened after the natural disaster. And those two should not be mixed because the very, very cause, the root cause, uh, that's something that will, um, as an international peace organization, have been calling for. Look at the cause of these violent situation violent situation as the Japanese government uh, describes. Violent, violent situation by war, again, could be avoided, can be avoided, and should be avoided by our policy. Natural disaster we can't avoid, but the violent, violent, that violent situation that women have to go through after the war, I mean, after, after the natural disaster, can be addressed, again, by proper policy, adequate policy. So that fundamental understanding of the differences in, uh, between war and natural disaster needs to lead the Women, Peace, uh, women, Peace and Security Agenda in, in different contexts. And the same thing. <laughs> um, so um, I hope, just to, uh, to sum up, um, 
the inter-Korea, uh, the women's activities, uh, feminist activities actually, feminist peace movement to uh, to change the situation in Korean, Korean Peninsula has become even more important now, and I would, I'm calling for a larger um, support from international community to raise your voice for a women's uh, inclusion of women, inclusion of gender perspective in this uh, in this so uh, in this uh, endeavor to solve the long-standing uh, Korean War. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Kim Yongsun, co-chair of Korea Women's Association United, and I'm here to introduce our organization. 네, 한국 여성 단체 연합은 1987년도에 창립이 되었고 어, 지난 30년 동안 어, 한국의 성평등 가치와 어, 국제 연, 한국의 성평등 가치를 위해서 활동해 왔습니다. 어, 한국 여성 단체 연합은 7개 지국 28개 회원 단체로 구성되어 있습니다. We Korea Women's Association United was established in 1987. It is an umbrella organization of six regional seven. Seven regional branches and 28 member organizations to strive to achieve gender equality, democracy, and peaceful unification of the Korea Peninsula. Um, <laughs> 인권, 폭력, 어, 그리고 어, 노동, 사회권, 어, 그리고 법 제도를 만드는 활동을 하고 있고 지금 현재는 어, 미투, 리더 이후 활동을 주요하게 하고 있습니다. We cover basically a wide range of causes and issues of women, uh, which includes human rights, violence against women, peace, labor, and law and institution. We recently made a national-wide special committee for the Meet Too campaign. Uh, 오늘 uh, 참석해 주셔서 고맙습니다. Uh, 한국 여성 단체 연합의 많은 한, uh, 한국의 평화 문제에 uh, 많은 관심을 가져주시기 바랍니다. Thank you. Thank you for attending here, and I'd like you to keep your attention for Korea Peace Movement. I will briefly turn to the recent changes in and around the National Action Plan of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security, Republic of Korea. Two points are being made. One, the current situation of Korea concerning the resolution. And the second is review and recommendation of the National Action Plan. It is to know that candlelight abolition last year in Korea and the women who participated in the movement are not producing massive wave of media campaign. 
So it is important to point that women who used to be the adversely affected by armed conflicts and gender-based violence are now an impressively vocal and involved in the areas of peace, unification, and national defense. The changing situation in Korea calls women to be a peacemaker. Also, the Ministry of Gender Equality and Family recently launched the second version of the National Action Plan of the Revolution. About the review and recommendation of the past action plan, seven points are being made. 네, 첫 번째는 정부의 정치적 의지와 리더십입니다. 어, 정부의 강력한 정치적 의지가 부족합니다. 어, 주무 부처인 여가부는 어, 국자 그리고 타 부처는 운영 지원 과장이 집행에 참여하고 있으며 어, 정부의 고위 수준이 아니라 낮은 수준에서 국가 행동 계획을 운영하고 있습니다. 담당자의 도체가 빈번하고 전문성이 부족합니다. Okay, um, we're running out of time, so I've... Quickly, the South Korean government is lacking strong political will to advance the national action plan. It is the junior official who actually deals the implementation and establishment of the national action plan. And also, the frequent replacement of government personnel causes the issue of lacking expertise. Not only that, the Ministry of Gender Equality only focuses compiling and collecting the results of the programs conducted by the ministries and agencies. So it is required for the junior government. Um, Roger, please. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Why are the natural action plan? Is it okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why are the natural action plan actually includes all aspects of the resolution? The actual program and projects covers only limited part of the programs. The Ministry of Government and only focus on education and the prevention of sexual harassment, sexual assault, gender responsive budgeting, and including more women in the government committees. It is necessary to actualize the programs and projects in compliance with the resolutions. Also, during the evaluation process, it is highly required to consider the long-term impact with the short-term outcomes. 네, 다섯 번째는 법적 근거가 불충분합니다. 국가 행동 계획을 위한 법률 개정, 양성평등 기본법 어, 일부 개정 법률안이 남희순 의원 대표 발의로 어, 3월 13일에 발의가 되어서 11월에 통과되었습니다. There is a lack problem of lacking legal grounds. A legal grounds to design and establish the national action plan is still insufficient. The Parliament approved the revision of the Gender Equality Act last November, which was proposed by Congresswoman Dan Insun. Um, although the revised Act enabled and legalized the implementation of the National Action Plan under the control of the Committee of Gender Equality, there is still a lot of work to be done. The first one is the 특히 평화 안보 분야는 여성 참여를 지방 차원까지 확대시키기 위해서 지방화 프로젝트가 활성화되어야 합니다. The next is the necessity of localization of national action plan. Okay, yeah. localization of the plan is also required to extend women's equal participation, especially in the areas of national defense, peace, and unification at regional level. 마지막으로. 어, 한반도에서 맥락을 말씀드리겠습니다. 문제의 피해자가 아니라 평화 구축의 주체로서 여성의 역할이 강조되어야 합니다. 그러나 현재 남측에서는 남북대와 한반도 평화 관련 논의에 장에서 여성들의 목소리가 배제되고 있습니다. 더 많은 여성들의 참여를 위해서는 정부의 정책 변화와 시민사회 협력이 필요합니다. Okay, here's the last one. Uh, in the context of Korean Peninsula, the role of women as a proactive peacemaker should be noted. As I said earlier, we, we women who used to be victimized, uh, by, victimized by armed conflicts and gender-based violence are now turning very vocal and proactively involved in the areas of peace, unification, and national defense. However, women in South Korea are excluded from the discussion of inter-Korean relations and peace by the government talks. So it is strongly required to change government policies and cooperate with civil society to ensure full participation of women in areas of peace, national defense, and foreign affairs. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Somebody just passed up a note to say we'd really like to hear a little bit more about uh, less about 1325 yeah. and more about uh, some specific action. But um, if I can speak in defense of 1325, <clears throat> this is, I think, what we were hearing is that, yes, the Security Council has said women must be included in all issues related to peace building. And what we're hearing from our speakers so far, from Japan and from South Korea, is Yes, they, that, those words are there, but the, there's a resistance to the inclusion. And that's, that's a problem. If we're trying to make a difference on the Korean Peninsula, and they're in South Korea, and they're still being excluded. So that's, I think, the essence of what we were hearing. But in, we do have some positive uh, comments coming up, and I'm going to pass this to Liz Bernstein. Thank you. It's wonderful to see you all this morning. Thank you, Janice, and all of my co-panelists. I'm thrilled to be here with you. I have the privilege of serving as the executive director of the Nobel Women's Initiative, which is a group of six fabulous activist Nobel Peace Prize laureates who came together to share the prize with people like you, with people like Janice, with people like Christine with feminist peace movements 
using their voice to amplify voices of feminist peace movements working for peace and justice and equality. And really doing what we're doing today. We are really have a tall agenda to stop a nuclear war. And we have a tall agenda to build a lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. So we are so honored to be doing that here today. And we're going to tell you, I'm going to tell you a little bit about one example of one action we did together to insist that we, in fact, be at the tables. We um, gathered together um, in January, raising our voices and demanding a seat at a table put together by governments. Um, and at first, ignoring us. If we hadn't knocked on that door and insisted that 1325 provided a, a forum for us, we wouldn't have been there. But we were. We composed an international delegation of 16 women from feminist peace movements around the world, from Asia, from Europe, and North America, and we all went to Vancouver, Canada to call for a peace process focused on diplomacy, engagement, that included women. And we were wanting to ensure that peace, reconciliation, and a genuine security took precedence over militarization and a march towards war. So why did we end up in Vancouver? Well, the Canadian government was co-hosting with the US government at the time, <laughs> Rex Tillerson and our foreign affairs minister, Freeland, an event with 20 nations and ministers to discuss security and stability on the Korean Peninsula. And we said, you're not discussing this without us. We wanted to make sure the representatives for women's peace movements were there. In Ottawa, we hosted a delegation of women across the DMZ together with Canadian Voice of Women for Peace and our Women, Peace and Security Network Canada in December and in introducing them to parliamentarians, to civil servants, to the bureaucracy and the Global Affairs of Canada. Every meeting we went to, we said, wonderful, you're hosting a meeting on stability in the Korean Peninsula and we assume you're going to include us. We assume you will have a table for women peace activists. Wasn't so assumed. But we reminded them, indeed we have a feminist foreign policy. Our Minister Freeland said, the path to peace needs, em needs empowered women, and where women are included in peace processes, peace is more enduring. She repeated this yesterday in an event inside the UN. Indeed, Canada had passed its National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security in November, a new updated one with five ministers, including defense, uh, around the tables. And we have a feminist international assistance policy just put into place where women and girls are supposed to be at the heart. And the government has pledged uh, funding for women's organizations, as Minister Bibeau mentioned also yesterday at the same event in the UN, that women's organizations are not just beneficiaries, but partners. So what a robust policy framework. Aren't you sure we need to be there at Vancouver? So we put together our delegation with Women Cross the DMZ and Canadian Voice of Women for Peace and headed to Vancouver. We insisted that we have meetings with government representatives. Our parliamentary secretary for foreign affairs, Matt DeCourcy, hosted with Minister Freeland a round table with us, um, unsatisfactory as it was before the minister's meeting and not during the minister's meeting, but it was a step that wouldn't have happened at all without us. We also had a meeting with Minister uh, Freeland, and we also engaged um, in really fabulous actions that women such as yourselves and men working for, pe for peace do all the time. We were outside of the venue with uh, banners reminding the delegates that they were coming to discuss peace, to discuss diplomacy. We reminded them with uh, the um, beautiful gifts of uh, Jo Jaffo, of these beautiful scarves from Korea with peace in all of the languages of the participating nations, that we were preparing the tables for peace, for productive talks, for diplomacy. So we tried to gift them as they walked in. <laughs> We tried to engage them as they walked in, as we weren't 
uh, allowed in the buildings, but we were very polite but noisy outside. <laughs> Respectful but present outside. And of course, no component is complete without making our voices heard. We engaged the media as best we can, we, we could. We had an uh, extreme amount of uh, interviews from all of our delegates from across the world, even uh, Eva from Sweden uh, doing interviews in French, such a diverse group of delegates with so many skills. So we were able to get the word out through our media channels as well. And indeed, we did get the closest that we've been to the tables in talks over Korea yet. Um, and we expanded and strengthened our global women in peace movement to work together for peace on the Korean Peninsula. We learned about the power of our collective organizing because we brought this all together in three weeks. We raised money, we got plane tickets, we got all of the, all of the logistical uh, things we needed as well as the political meetings together within three weeks. Christmas. <laughs> Over Christmas on top of it. And also we thought if we hadn't been in Vancouver, the final communique coming out would not have included point eight, saying the co-chair stressed the important role of civil society actors and non-government organizations in supporting efforts to foster the conditions for a diplomatic solution, and in particular the critical role of women and women's organizations play in contributing to conflict resolution and enduring peace. Well, they haven't yet implemented, but it's there. And we can follow up again and make sure they do, just like with 1325. So it is a start for all of us. And again, our engagement hasn't ended with Vancouver. We are continuing to work together with women and peace movements, feminist movements from the South Korea, North Korea, from the US, China, Japan, Russia, and all of the other nations in Europe to work together building peace in the region. And we will be continuing. You'll hear from Christine some of the upcoming events that we hope you will join us for. And we're working on such things as convening a series of roundtables of women peace experts and um, uh, peace marches, peace walks, and the Korean Peninsula, which you'll hear more about. And we really do hope all of you will join us in the movement, the women's movement, for ending or preventing a nuclear war and building lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. Thanks so much. Ah. Last but not least, as Wilk often reminds us, if we continue to invest billions in war and pennies in peace, we get what we pay for. So we continue to push for more money for peace movements such as the Women Cross the D, MC, and others. And you're invited to join us in an event shifting the power on how we can support financially women's peace movements on Thursday at the Cervantes Institute at 9.30. Thank you. Hello, my name is Yi Ye Jung. I'm from South Korea. I'm working for the Korean Sharing Movement. And KSN is, is, was established in 1996 when the uh, North Korean famine was at the peak. So for the last more than uh, 20 years, we provided uh, humanitarian and development assistance to North Korea. Uh, today I'd like to talk a little bit about the Vancouver experience. Actually, I was there with these and Christian and many others. So I'd like to share my uh, experience and what I've learned there. So as you know, Korean Peninsula issue is not just Korean issue. It's related to the uh, peace of the region and also the world. So I think it's very important to uh, work together to bring about peace on the Korean Peninsula. In that sense, last uh, Vancouver uh, Women's Peace Forum was a really special opportunity for me to work with international women peace workers. And personally, I really learned a lot. I really learned a lot. Uh, the way they share ideas and put them together and organize actions, handle media, yeah, everything, everything impressed me a lot. In addition, 
as an NGO activist who provides assistance to North Korea, I again realized that we need to put more gender perspective in our assistance programs. As a South Korean, actually providing assistance to North Korea is a little bit different from uh, providing assistance to other countries. We strongly believe that our assistance and cooperation programs are the process of mutual understanding and reconciliation of the two Koreas. For example, uh, KSM alone, more than 6,500 people visited North Korea through KSM channel. So, as you know, meeting each other is the beginning of the reconciliation. And South Korean NGOs have been the bridge they made. And I'm really proud of, I'm the part of it. But because of our unique situation and unique relationship, actually we haven't paid much attention uh, to refine our programs. And one of the pro problems of our previous programs is the lack of a gender perspective. Even though gender equality and gender perspective are a cross-cutting issue, and global standard in the field of assistance and development, I think we, South Korean NGOs, we've been too busy handling precarious environments, uh, which might cause the suspension of our works in North Korea. In that sense, the Vancouver meeting made me again realize the importance of gender perspective in our cooperation and assistance programs in North Korea, as well as the importance of women's peace movement. So, I don't know, you know, you know maybe uh, for the last seven, eight years, actually, South Korean NGOs assistance program uh, have been suspended because of the deteriorating relationships between the two Koreas. However, uh, fortunately, a recent development between the two Koreas will reopen the cooperation programs of NGOs. And it will be the new phase of our work. So, like women peacemakers here make great efforts to make this new phase we South Korean NGOs will do our best to maintain this moment, momentum and open the new phase of inter-Korean civil cooperation and pave the way for peaceful integration of the two Koreas. Thank you. Good morning, and thanks so much for the invitation to be here. I'm Senator Mary Lou McFedrin from Canada, an independent senator in the second house of Canadian Parliament, and the place where now 45% of the senators are women. Yeah. Um, this is a direct result of the decision by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to appoint only independents and to appoint a majority of women in his time as Prime Minister in just the last two years. And in just a couple more appointments, the independent senators will become, for the first time in Canada's entire history, the majority in our Senate, not with party affiliation. So it just may be a time of opportunity to move the peace agenda and awareness of really what is the single greatest threat to our environment, the single greatest threat to a climate, the single greatest threat to the concepts of inclusion and peace and the rule of law, and that is nuclear war. I wish I could stand here and tell you that Canada is a signatory to the treaty, nuclear ban treaty. I can't tell you that. I have to tell you in truth that we weren't even in the room in July of 2017 when more than 120 countries, member states of the UN, uh, did decide to commit to the nuclear ban treaty. 
So there's a tremendous opportunity here for the Canadians that are with me this morning. I'm going to be really brief. I want to just state very clearly that before the very recent appointment to the Senate, I have been a member of civil society. Um, I have been involved with the WILF academic advisors and a member and Voice of Women for Peace and many other women's organizations, civil society organizations in Canada. But my anecdote is really to deliver this message. Don't wait to be invited to any of the aspects of what we have to do now for sustaining peace and trying to stop this war. Don't wait to be invited. For example, um, you just heard a bit about my civil society background. I was in Vancouver and I had asked for some considerable period of time to be there at the civil society round table with Minister Freeland and four levels of bureaucracy within global affairs all the way to the top said no. And it was very interesting to me because the reason was because I'm a parliamentarian and my civil society credentials weren't strong enough to a point to get me in the room. This is also a point to you about women's leadership and finding the places of common ground of being able to say to women leaders, good, now can we just go another step? Can we make this even better? Because I would not have been in the room with these wonderful women to be part of uh, carrying the message back to the Senate, back to Parliament, unless Minister Freeland herself, she had overruled the decision to keep me out. And as the minister said, no, of course, she needs to be there. So in these situations where so often there's this gap between the resources we have and the power we have in terms of governmental power, Let's just keep reminding everyone that we need to be dealing with and getting access to, through to the processes where we need to be part of them, that this is about, may, some people may call it feminist foreign policy or feminist um, international assistance, but this is about our world. This is about the single greatest threat to everything that is listed in all of these policies to which we are committed. None of it matters unless we get this one right. So with great thanks to all of the work that's been done, so little recognition relative to all the work, with such limited resources, it's really extraordinary. And I hope we all leave here today really committing to be part of this peace movement. Thank you. It's amazing. We um, brought so many women to speak, and we're right on time. Um, <laughs> as Gloria Steinem says, women like to travel in packs, and I think it's because we have so much power, because when we do so. Um, I'm Christine On. I'm the founder and international coordinator of Women Cross DMZ. We're a global movement of women mobilizing for peace on the Korean Peninsula. And um, Rex Tillerson, maybe out, he's the pragmatic, he's the diplomat that said, let's talk about talking. And uh, he may be out, but clearly what is evidenced in the room is the women's peace movement is in. And when we're organized and we're mobilized, we are not going to have a new Korean War. And we're actually gonna pivot from war to a permanent peace treaty on the Korean Peninsula. Yeah, I, it's a new day. And the women's marches, the Me Too movement, it's now time for those of us that have been pioneering for a feminist foreign policy that pushes for a foreign policy built on diplomacy, international cooperation and peace. It's our moment now, right? Yes. Um, I'm gonna just quickly, instead of talking about Women Cross Tea, we're gonna show a little video about Women Cross DMZ because in 2015, Women Cross DMZ we uh, were not waiting for a 1325 National Action Plan that Hillary Clinton under the Obama administration basically said the way to ensure women peace and security is to have more women soldiers. We don't believe that that is the way to achieve a feminist foreign policy. We believe in women's peace movements, peace movements being at the 
stable and, uh, and a different kind of foreign policy, not built on war, more militarization and aggression. So um, we need to, what do we do? We take the streets. And so in 2015, Women Cross DMC organized a historic crossing with 30 women peacemakers from 15 countries. We held symposiums on women, peace and security with women in North Korea and women in South Korea in partnership with women's groups in North Korea and women in South Korea. And I should just start by saying we believe it's an international and a global movement to end the Korean War because the Korean War was not just fought between North and South Korea. The United States led the United Nations Command that included 16 countries, many countries from throughout Europe, Netherlands, France, the UK, there were Canada. Canada was one of the largest sending troops. It has to be a global movement. We need all of you to join us in this movement to push for a peace treaty. They promised it, the US as a signatory to the Armistice Agreement in 1953, signed a ceasefire with North Korea and China. They said within 90 days, we will return to move this military agreement signed by military leaders into a political agreement. And yes, Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump may have a meeting by May. That's a long way between now and then. And as I told the North Korean mission yesterday, if you think that Donald Trump is just going to sign this without a political will, without the will of the people on the ground pushing for it, you don't understand how democracy works. It may work in North Korea, it does not work this way in the United States or around the world. And when we know, when women's peace movements are involved in any peace process, what happens? There is a peace agreement. And when we're part of drafting that agreement, it is far more durable. So we have a responsibility, we have a role to play women. So we're gonna just show a quick little video and then we're gonna take some questions. We're gonna talk about what steps we have and how you can all join us in achieving a peace deal. Thank you.
2018 is the 70th anniversary of the creation of two separate states, the Republic of Korea in the South and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea in the North. Women Cross TNC hopes to work with our partners in South and North Korea for another historic crossing with women coming from Asia, from Europe, from the Americas. We are committed to seeing a peace treaty that ends the Korean War. And we won't stop until we see a peace treaty. So join us. We need you to join us, men and women, to ensure that a peace treaty is signed so that there is peace on the Korean Peninsula, so families can be reunited, and so that there isn't going to be a global nuclear war that threatens all of our security. So I just wanted to, before we wrap up and, um, and invite questions, I wanted to just uh, make a few announcements. So one is that, as I noted in the video, we hope to do another DMZ crossing in May. And uh, we, oh God, the microphone. Am I talking too loud? Okay. <laughs> Um, so in May, inter May 24th is International Women's Day for Peace and Disarmament. And we want to try another historic crossing this year. This year, uh, possibly going from south to north uh, and walking with international women, with South Korean women uh, across the DMC into North Korea and having a symposium there. Um, we obviously need the approval of North Korea, South Korea, and obviously the U.S. The U.S., we, uh, U.S. citizens face an additional obstacle, uh, which is the U.S. travel ban to DP, DPRK imposed by the Trump administration. But uh, we hope that there is, just as we did in Vancouver, we organized uh, massive uh, signatures to press uh, Canada and the foreign ministers that were meeting in Vancouver to invite women and women peace activists to be at the table, we hope that there will be some kind of global solidarity of women's groups around the world as we cross the DMZ. Um, so that's one. Uh, number two is that uh, we're going to launch a women-led 2020 peace treaty campaign. And right now, we have formed a coalition, Women Cross DMZ, Nobel Women's Initiative, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and Women's Action for New Direction Wand. I know, it's a big deal. We're gonna try to do it. It's gonna take a lot of work. Hopefully there will be some funding to support it, but uh, we have made that commitment. We believe that Moon Jae-in, who's the South Korean president, we have to support the inter-Korean peace process. We, that's just one singular thing that the global movement must do at this moment. And Moon Jae-in, who, you know, this, this diplomatic deal that we have yet to see between the U.S. and North Korea, it was not the result of maximum pressure. It's the result of incredible commitment to diplomacy, masterful diplomacy by Moon Jae-in, the South Korean president. He needs to be uh, recognized, and he only is in office till 2022. We are in a historic moment. The global women's peace movement must see through a peace treaty in the next few years. I, I can't even tell you the urgency of that. And um, I think that's it. Uh, and I guess I, I guess I should announce this just to show that there is progress being made. The South Korean women, our partners in South Korea, submitted a proposal to the South Korean government for our May activities, including a symposium, international symposium, and including a DMZ crossing. We just got news today that the Minister of Gender Equality is supporting 
that. So one down, two more to go, but it's going to take all of us being organized and mobilized. So please, I hope uh, we brought a few of these uh, annual reports, and there's a, a sign-up sheet. Please sign it. Please stay, stay connected. We need all of you. Well, this is the time for you if you have questions. And I wonder how we can manage this so we can hear your questions easily. Thank you. My name is Ellen Barfield. I served in the U.S. Army in South Korea in 1980. Some of you know what happened that year. I am very sorry for putting my body into this process. I didn't understand it at the young and stupid. I understand it now. Hold it further down. I really want to be included. Had I known about the previous DMZ activity, I might have not waited to be invited, but I didn't know about it until you were doing it. I am former military. It's an important voice. I hope I can be included. And this is going in and out. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Patricia Bradley. I'm a uh, UN representative for the Women's Missionary Society of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And I'd like to know specifically how can uh, NGOs, especially faith based NGOs, uh, be a part of this and specifically what can we be doing? Thank you so much. Um, we actually have a bunch of faith-based NGOs that are a bit part of our effort. In Vancouver, we had the United Church of Canada, Patricia Talbot, who was one of the leaders that came to join our delegation. And um, this room was put together by the United Methodist Women. Tung Ok Lee, who's the Secretary General, has been uh, one of our advisors, very dedicated. But we need more, and we need you, for sure, to be involved. Um, obviously, this is I think what's so powerful about women's movements leading this effort is we don't work in silos. We work together, we call all of our friends, we know who knows who, um, and we try to be intersectional, we try to bring a broad coalition. So we have been, um, our Vancouver delegation was not just geographically diverse, but we included uh, Ye Jung, who is from the largest uh, movement in South Korea of NGOs working on humanitarian aid. We brought Ava Erickson, who used to be the DPRK country director of the Red Cross. We brought the faith-based community, the women's peace movement. So we believe that it's going to take a cross-section of groups that have been working, that have a commitment to seeing on the Korean Peninsula, uniting forces to really push for this. So I'm going to give you my card afterwards, and I would love for you to be involved with us. Somebody on the panel here would like to also respond to that. Actually, it was last week, uh, international uh, faith-based uh, community, they came to Seoul uh, because it, it marks uh, the 30th uh, anniversary of 88 uh, declaration of churches uh, for the peace on the Korean Peninsula. So I think this kind of uh, consultations and uh, inputs uh, from your uh, side could be a really, really a big help for the Korean society and also your partners in Korea. Thank you. I'm uh, Fred Sullivan from Executive Director of Manhattan Campaign. We really believe in women's peace uh, movement and 1325s and having to stay on top of all the uh, decision makers uh, to continue and increase access. So um, I think um, even the 25 million figure is very low. 
uh, I had a lecture by Dr. Ira Tufflin, and basically the nuclear, the dust cloud, actually with, um, just from one weapon or one US size weapon, could lower the temperature up to 45 degrees, which would basically stop agriculture and human life. Um, a small nuclear con conflict could make all the uh, poor or food insecure uh, die because we only have a 90-day supply. But I think, um, I think it's really important to frame, or my question is, how do we frame you know, and make more publicized that women are um, creating this movement for peace on the peninsula, and, along with the president, not this Trump association tactic of a force. It just seems like the story is being lost, and uh, you know, and it may hurt uh, mobilizing people to sign the nuclear free treaty. Very, very quickly, probably, uh, women's movement for uh, de denuclearization have been have been exist in existing for a very, very long time, and different kinds of uh, cooperation with different governments. I think that the part particular at this particular moment, I think what uh, what we are uh, trying to aim for is to support the uh, South Korean government, uh, who was democratically, uh, and he, at this, this was a result of a uh, uh, focused. Uh, Again, people's movement in South Korea, candle, uh, candle demonstration and revolution. And he needs uh, support not only from South Korea, but allied, particularly allied countries like Japan or the United States who may not want the, the peace on Korean Peninsula. And, uh, and women's, uh, women's peace movement needs to be recognized um, by but also we recognize each other's contribution in different parts of the world, again, to, to support this uh, focused effort that is going on currently by the, uh, but by the democratic government. Thank you. My name is Ang Yuri Sihab from the International Alliance of Women. And thank you very much for the fantastic workshop and your initiative. I really admire this. And I'd like to talk about the implementation of the United Nations Resolution 1325. It is not in implemented, as we all know, and uh, it's a binding resolution. So what can we do to force the Security Council Resolution to be implemented? It was only a year ago that I found out what you can do. You can send a legal opinion to the International Court of Justice in The Hague. It's not an easy process, but it can be done. You can send a complaint with a legal opinion to the International Court of Justice. And I just want to mention this, because I didn't know, and I didn't meet many people who did know. Thank you, I knew that's a very important uh, tip. I didn't know. Okay. I see three hands. Maybe we'll go, I see Cora here. She's been quite good. Let's go Cora and there's a woman here. And here. Cora is right here, purple. First, three cheers. Ten cheers for the panel. Terrific information. We need, we need this in the form of teachings everywhere to teach more people about the, the facts of war and peace. So this is a very sweet idea to go to The Hague, but the Security Council resolution is international law because according to the Charter of the UN, anything the Security Council agrees on has to be abided by by all the member states. I think it's Article 25 of the Charter, 
but you can, you should each have a charter, I think. Uh, they're very important. But the resolution was adopted, A, it was not voted on, and B, it doesn't have any mandating language. It doesn't say women shall, women should, you must. But we've turned it into <coughs> mandating language. And uh, that's a nice idea. I'd like to discuss it further, but I'm not sure it will fly. But we'll fl we've been, uh, I'm sorry that Mavic left. Mavic Beleza is the Organ, runs the organization dedicated to the implementation of 1325. It's called the Women's, the Global Network of Women Peace Builders, gnwp.org. Check it out. It's been implemented in over 60 countries, and it's in process in many more. And where it's been implemented, it's doing just fine. Look at Iceland. Look at the Scandinavian countries. It's, it's a tool to use for peace. Hi, my name is Monsa Bulos. I'm a student in high school. And as young activists, we want to know what we can do as to propose a peace trade as young women. Hi, my name is Regina Castro, and I also wanted to say that we really want to get more involved into these kind of movements because also there are Latin American countries that they don't even know what's happening in North Korea. And I mean, we just have 16 years old, and <laughs> we cannot do like have the resolve to fight for peace in the world, but. I know that we, as uh, young activists, can do really, really good things for other people. Is there someone who would like to respond about the engagement of youth? not the only uh, international peace, uh, peace women's peace organization, but uh, we have uh, we have programs for our youth, um, young will, and that connect uh, young women. Well, it also depends on how your definition of young. Uh, but uh, anyone who identify yourself as youth, uh, but we do we do have uh, focus on. Uh, high school and college uh, women and what well, you already hear and that's uh, I think that's a very different uh, experience of uh, other uh, high school students I wish my I wish the students of my uh, my school in Japan have uh, more opportunity to uh, to be here and to meet with uh, uh, activists internationally uh, but they have there are uh, there are actual uh, uh, activism, uh, activity. Uh, Will does have sections in Latin American countries. We have sections in 33 countries, and it's, uh, it's uh, increasing. Uh, you might want to check with. Uh, and I understand that Facebook is not for uh, young people anymore. It's for <laughs> <laughs> your parents' <laughs> generation, maybe older. <laughs> like Facebook, we tweet, right? I don't tweet, but <laughs> our office tweets. Uh, so, <laughs> and to be connected uh, um, in, in that way should be helpful to get information and also I think it's important for you to present your interpretation of, of what you learn here in your own setting. Because yeah. I don't speak that youth language. I speak English but I don't speak a you know, generational different language. So that, I think that's, uh, that's what we need. But thank you very much for your uh, offer. Yeah. I'll just add a little PS. Uh, Wilf has an office here in the church center. I think it's on the sixth floor. Uh, and it's identified under the name Jane Adams uh, Room because she was the first president, I believe, of, of Wilf. So you could go right there 
and, and, and pick up some literature and uh, make yourself known. And I, I think that's a very good tip to, to think of linking up with Will. I'd like to add something. Actually, in, uh, in the US, some five, six NGOs who are providing humanitarian and development assistance to North Korea. Actually, they were flourishing, but nowadays, because of the bad relationship between the two countries, it's very hard time for them. So support them. Maybe they will need volunteers like you guys. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. similar to what they asked over there. Um, I wanted to know specifically through this organization, how are you involving young girls because, or girls my age even, I'm 17, so. Um, I think it's really important to get them involved because we are the rising generation and our voice is gonna be the one that's gonna be carried on in the future and I know all the girls that I'm here with wanna see that we have a brighter future for the world because um, we need to keep this world happy, we need to make women strong, we need to make the world strong, we need change. So how specifically are you getting girls involved and giving them a safe environment to get involved? Well, first of all, we love volunteers, so please come <laughs> and grab, uh, you know, for example, Jacqueline Wells right over here. I gave a talk at Harvard uh, two years ago, and she joined as a volunteer, and now she's our communications coordinator. I think there's lots of ways to put you to work. Um, but actually, we are going to, as part of our campaign, is in the U.S., because the U.S., I believe, is the greatest obstacle to seeing a peace treaty. And uh, we're gonna need to mobilize here in the United States. And so, I don't know where you live, but I've been giving talks all around the country. Uh, for example, in Albany, a few weeks ago, I gave a talk that was organized by Women Against War. And they left there with a committee that was passing a city council resolution for a peace treaty. Um, similarly, in Santa Barbara this past week, I gave a talk to the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, a committee formed to pass a city council resolution I would love to work with you. And one thing that we said we would do is we're gonna organize a women's, young women's activist peace camp. And I think at that camp, we'll learn about the political issues, we'll do some media training, but other organizing, because we believe that it's not just Korea and stopping a nuclear war on the Korean Peninsula is seeing a lasting peace, but Korea could actually be uh, the, the key to world peace and to actually passing, uh, beginning the process to eliminate nuclear weapons. But we need to mobilize and we need young women to be um, talking about foreign policy. So I hope that uh, you and you will recruit other young women to join this. Uh, I, we hope to do it next spring break. Thank you, Christine. I hadn't heard about that proposal, but it's, it's a great one. And, and I can tell you, okay, and uh, Voice of Women in Canada has been running young women's peace leadership camps now for about four years across the country. Some of oh, our panel. Concerning the two questions about the UN Security Council resolution, uh, in Korea we, we actually enacted a law to implement the national plan and resolution. Uh, last November, a law, a, a revised act of gender equality, was passed in Parliament. So, 
The cost due to the revision of the Act, we are now enabled to implement and establish a national action plan under the Committee of Gender Reform. So this is the starting point. So what's the main is to establish a Establish another national action plan which fulfills what's included in the resolution. And also, we need to budget because there is no budget right now. And the third is to invent indicators to measure the progress of the national action plan and the resolution of 1325. So, we, uh, the Minister of Organization, are trying to push the government to adopt the UN's uh, indicators about the measuring the national action plan and we want you to push the government as well. So, and about the May crossing, uh, yes, we are invite you to come join the peace crossing in May. It is going to be a huge uh, movement for our peace. So thank you.